This episode of Lord John Lander includes conversation about sexual violence that some listeners may find distressing. Support resources are available from RAIN.org, including a confidential helpline for those in the U.S. That's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Welcome to Lord John Lander, the Outlander podcast for Lord John fans, where we talk about all things Outlander, but especially about Jamie and his Sassanac. And sometimes we talk about Claire, too. For however long it takes, we'll lead you on a journey so chaotic, you'll question every life choice that led you to be here today. And like the Hotel California, you can check out any time, but you can never leave. We may not be the Outlander podcast you wanted, but we will be the Outlander podcast you didn't know you needed. Now, before we get into it, this is your one and only warning that show and book spoilers are lurking around every corner. We're going to spoil stuff from future seasons, future books, and our own brains. Remember, if you can't prove our headcanon didn't happen, then we can only assume that it did. If you make it through the episode in one piece, we'd love to hear from you. Send us your burning questions, wild theories, thick prompts, flattering compliments, or whatever's on your mind. You can contact us on Twitter and Tumblr at Lord John Lander or on our website at lordjohnlander.wordpress.com where you'll also find our archived episodes, teasers, thick wrecks, and more. Hello, welcome to Lord John Lander. We're your hosts. I'm Mistress Pandora. You can still call me Pan. And I'm Beth. This week, we are talking about episode 206, Best Laid Schemes. That title could be yeah. worse. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah. It's, I don't have much, yeah. <laughs> Do they all correspond to chapter titles? I never, I never looked I, into that. I think most of them do. Hmm. I don't think they all do, but I think most of them do. Got it. Got it. I think I might have called this one something about pestilence and disease, whatever that line that Jamie had was. (laughs) Well, Claire is making him violently ill. (laughs) I do like that line. If anyone can bring pestilence and disease, it's us. (laughs) Oh, the dramatic irony. It's like the tagline, right? Oh my god. <laughs> well, we're almost okay, so but we're almost out of Paris, right? We've got this one and then the, the next one which we're so looking forward to. And then we're out of Paris. Is yes. that right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, and I mean, I I can say that like, you know, Murta again, you know, kind of just speaks for us all. Like he, he's just ready to go home, and so are we. Um, oh God! <laughs> I just, yeah, they've the Paris episodes have never been my favorite, you know, and yeah. they continue to not be. Again, you know, I think the costumes are amazing. Yeah. I think the sets are amazing. Um. But it's just not a very, it could be very compelling, but it's not. Um, And I don't think I remember it being a very, my favorite part of the books either, right? Like I was just kind of like, okay, you know, Um, so here we are and we're building up to the, uh, I guess you could call it the, the mid-season climax right um, yeah and it's all downhill from here <laughs> swiftly yeah swiftly downhill so yeah so let's talk about this episode i guess <laughs> i mean we could talk about something else <laughs> There's a couple of fun things we can. Okay. I'm just I'm just okay. going to be a belligerent pain in the ass. I'm going to let that be my shtick tonight. How's that? Okay. Perfect. <laughs> just what I needed. <laughs> you know, I have I have a teenager and a preteen at home, Pan. You know, so that's exactly what I need in a podcast co-host. <laughs> <laughs> should make it should make it really relaxing for you then. 
<laughs> Hold on, let me take a pill. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Or a shot, whatever. <laughs> um, so like, and Mercha is just, he just kind of continues to be the voice of reason throughout this whole segment of the, of the show. You know, they're mixing up freaking fake s- smallpox and stuff. And um, he's like, what the hell are we doing here? Like, come on. And all I can think of is he must be so tired of being the brain for three people that he's just, he, <laughs> he's just so sick of it. There is one brain cell between them and marta has got it. His back has to be getting sore. <laughs> from carrying it it's a lot to carry it's a lot to carry um they finally tell Myrta the truth about yes. Claire and what they're doing um which thank god because please stop treating this man like an idiot it, yeah exactly and he took it exactly as Anyone would have predicted that Myrta would take it. Hey, man, if you think that your wife is a witch, I am not going to argue with you. And then he cold cocked Jamie right in the jaw. And it was righteous. <laughs> Great hit, man. Good job. Thank totally, you, Marta. Totally deserved it. I mean, especially when Jamie is in Lair dumbass mo- mode for like a oh. continuous length of time. He should just get like it. Like at least a weekly cold cock for Myrta just to keep him, you know, humble and <laughs> from somebody. Yeah, I mean, he's just <laughs> and he threatens to do it again later. I mean, get the other side of that of your mouth, like, yeah, yeah. do it, do it. <laughs> oh, god, when he's trying on those clothes, he's like a child, it's hilarious. <laughs> they don't like them, they don't fit, they restrict my movement. I'm like. I love you, Myrta. That's a mood, though. Like, I also hate trying on clothes. <laughs> what else have we got? So, so Claire and Jamie sort of kind of it looks like they've made up or had some sort of like detente in their um, their argument about killing Jack Randall and frank and and all of this stuff right like jamie's resolved he's not gonna he's not gonna duel him and um he's and jamie's giving claire a foot massage so you know clearly they've they've come to some sort of not pissed at each other place which is you know it's a good place to be it is it's kind of interesting to just like miss the in between though because like you know when worst we left them at the end of last episode, Jamie was like, don't touch me. Um, so, but anyway, and uh, they probably just like banged it out with the moonlight or something again. True. Um, you know, and Jamie has some really reasonable explanations or, reasoning or whatever you want to call it about Frank and Claire just continues to be single-minded but Frank is innocent in all this and it's like it's I don't want to beat a dead horse but it's like you're not first of all you don't know how this time travel shit works anyways so like whatever and then second of all it's like you're not like killing the man Okay, like, if he ceases to exist, he ceases to exist. Like, that's... It's not like he's suffering and dying, but... (laughs) And, and, whatever. And, like, as as this season, as every season of this this show, as every book points out, you can't make changes like that. Right. Right, exactly. It's completely futile. So... And it's really, maybe that's why this season is just so annoying (laughs) because they haven't learned the lesson yet. Okay, fine. But, but, you know, like they're striving towards this goal and the first time you watch it, okay, it's not, you already know, but damn it. 
I've tied myself in a knot here. We already know it didn't work from jump from jump on this season. We already know this is futile. So why are we right. spending all of this time? This is the worst interpretation of Save the Cat I have ever seen in my fucking life. <laughs> I'm, I'm so frustrated. <laughs> it's true. Like we totally know it. Uh, they, they told us at the beginning. Told, like spoiler they warning. <laughs> they, I, the first episode of this season should have had a freaking spoiler warning for the <laughs> spoiler warning. If you see the first 55 minutes of this episode, you're gonna know how the season ends. Like <laughs> And we know Why would they that, that Frank obviously survives too. I know. <laughs> so listening There's... to Claire go on and on and on for like three episodes about Frank disappearing. Uh, we're just like, eh. st- there are no stakes. Th- okay. I'm glad. I'm glad we've had this conversation now because <laughs> I finally put my finger on it. This is why I'm so annoyed. There's no stakes at all. <laughs> Well, in the first time you watch it through, to be fair, you have so many questions, right? Because well, yes. you only you only get that like half of an episode and you're like, okay, when, you know, first of all, when did she go back, right? Like you don't know if she's just survived Culloden or it yeah. goes back at the end of Parrot. Like, you know, there's still all these open questions about, about, and, and what baby is this, right? Because she's pregnant and mm-hmm. when she shows up in um, the 20th century, she's pregnant, but she's not very far along. And like, as Paris goes on, you're like, okay, well, it's definitely not this baby. So right. kind of, you know, what happened to this other baby and, you know, whatever. But so when you frame a story... And you use a literary device, you use framing a story as a literary device where you kind of start at the end and then go back and tell the story. There's a good way to do that and a bad way to do that. It's risky. It's, It's a risky, it's a risky maneuver. And kind of like trying to like trick your audience or your reader is kind of in my mind, like sort of a cheap way to do it. Yeah. There's there's other ways to go about it that are more complex than than what's happening here where it's just kind of like we're just guessing like what baby is it and what happened and whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's... Maybe I'm just being really uh bitchy tonight, but <laughs> <laughs> Me too. You know what? Like I was, I spent a lot of time in my freaking kitchen today and I'm just, I'm real beat. I'm real <laughs> tired. My knees hurt. So <laughs> I'm just going to be crotchety. It's <laughs> just going to be Marta. It, and I just right. wonder, oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, well, but you're, you're right though. So as a, as a storytelling device, it is, it's clunky it's kind of risky and i agree with you on that whole trying to trick your audience thing like it's one thing to lay lay the groundwork along the way to ensure that your audience is feeling the tension feeling the stress feeling the emotions that you want them to feel as you go so like if you need them to feel a tragedy you need to give them something happy and then take it away. If you want them to experience something joyful, you need to have them overcome something like everything has a give and take. And I would say that the first time through, to be fair, the first time watching this season, you do have a lot of questions and you do want to know more and you want to keep clicking next episode, but it doesn't rewatch well. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a big part of it. It just because you're just kind of like, this is all kind of it's ends up pointless. being pointless. Yeah, yeah, it's completely futile. I'm going to take two seconds just and very without spoilers, make this about the interview with a vampire series on AMC. If you haven't watched it, you should. Um, those episodes, I have never seen a more rewatchable piece of media in my life. Oh, like it's. 
they they do the thing where they make you feel the things that they need you to feel to experience the story and it's a very very visceral way that they do it and they do it in 40 minutes or less wow and you can rewatch it and catch new things every time like i've binged so what's out so far as we were recording this i have binged everything at least twice <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so there is a right way and a wrong way. And I have a feeling that right way, wrong way conversation is going to bring that show back in a couple of times more before the, the series is over. <laughs> <laughs> so I still haven't watched yet, um, but I did see that there was some big controversy over in the fandom or whatever over last week's episode. So I'm kind of interested to see how that all plays out. I uh, I'm still kind of waiting uh, my husband and I are going to watch it together and yeah. we kind of want to wait till it's all available that's um, fair plus... because this week <laughs> is torture yeah. <laughs> plus we're watching what we do in the shadows so oh yes we... so when we were <laughs> we were trying to figure out what to watch at one point and I was like we had I had like a list mm -hmm. we're going through the list and he was like I had already mentioned interview with the vampire. And then he's like, would well, you want to watch the vampires? And I'm like, yeah. Oh, wait, the funny vampires or the gay vampires. <laughs> like, <laughs> so we have to distinguish now between our vampire shows because, um, but yeah, so we'll probably, I, how many are there going to be eight or 10 episodes of it? Seven. Seven. Oh, that's a weird number. That's just, discomforting yeah uh, um <laughs> i'm so fucking stressed so i, I have like it so the the episode you're talking about because this will it might i think i think the finale will have already posted by the time this airs but that was episode 105 and oh yeah that was a fucking dumpster fire of a fandom week holy uh, crap oh <laughs> it was bad <laughs> and, and i'm like a Lord John loving Outlander fan saying it was dumpster fire. <laughs> oh, like, I'm just going to not interact with anybody. Speaking of dumpster fires, should we talk a little bit about what happened this week with Sam's book or should we just lay, let it be laid to, kept laid to rest? <laughs> I mean, we, we could. It's not going to be super timely. Yeah. So we're recording this on October 30th. So Sam's book came out, I think this just this past Monday or Tuesday or something. Um, and waypoints, by the way, waypoints. Yes. Um, I haven't read the whole thing yet, but I did pre-order it. And my friend was like, Oh, look at this, this, um, this part in the book that talks about, where Sam talks about filming the Wentworth episodes. So I went and read it. It's like, I don't even know, because I use an e-reader, so I don't even know how many actual pages. It's not a big part. Well, it's like two tops. Yeah. yeah. It's a few paragraphs. But he just talks about how, well, he's what he's talking about is, you know, he has a clause in his contract um, that he is obligated to do all nudity, including full frontal nudity, and I guess they, um, during those scenes, they had filmed him fully frontal. And I think that he didn't quite know that they were going to do that. And then they did. And he made the argument that why do we need to show like full frontal nudity for this? It's just sexualizing the rape and torture that Jamie's going through, which, if our listeners recall, <laughs> was mm -hmm. a huge part of what Pan and I talked about um, in our episode about those ep about them in our uh, episode one point one six, um, and we actually talked about other ways in which they sexualized that the whole sequence. Um, so it was it was kind of um, con confirming like if it, it was nice to kind of see that from, from Sam's perspective too, there was some of that going on. And it, he said too, that his trust with the, in, in the creative team was broken a little bit 
because of some things that went down with that. And the reaction in both the media and from some of the fandom is just absolutely sickening. First mm -hmm. of all, he wrote an entire book. Yep. And this is what they choose to focus on these like two or three paragraphs and a, a lot, not all, but a lot of the media headlines are like Sam Hewen felt quote unquote betrayed by Outlander production team during over full frontal nudity, like things like that. And then it's just kind of like making it sound like he like he was, was exaggerating. Whining, ex mm -hmm. Yeah, exaggerating. Um, shouldn't have said what he said. And he did it. I mean, he was very, like, I thought he, he I thought his tone, everything was, like, excellent in how he presented it. Yeah, because he explained how that experience led to bringing on the intimacy coordinator. So right. he was, he's been very gracious with his silence about this experience for mm -hmm. years. Like, and I mean, gracious. He, he waited until the problem had been resolved so that yeah. it, this is not something that's going to happen on this show again. He waited until it had already been corrected before he was actually kind of critical. And he wasn't even being accusatory or critical he was just explaining what happened and how it made him feel and why we now have intimacy coordinators on outlander right and how happy he is with her work yeah it's like he wasn't even like really pointing fingers he just yeah. said my trust was broken and like you know that's how he felt about the situation um and then some of the quote unquote oh. fans i mean gross you know just you know comments about Oh, Tobias Menzies didn't complain and, you know, grow up kind of, you know, just really, really nasty stuff from people that are supposedly fans. And it's kind of interesting because I have been saying to another one of my friends before this all kind of, you know, because the book was out for like a day or two before all this sort of started popping up. And I was saying to one of my friends, I was joking that... I, I was imagining all the um, former show, watch, former show or book fans that have left the fandom that are going to buy the book just to like hate read it or whatever. Because and the reason I said that is because I have never experienced a fandom where. The people, not all the people, obviously, but where there's such a, a group of people that leave the fandom and yet cannot leave the fandom alone. That mm -hmm. like, it's like they leave the fandom and then join their like hater club of Outlander and still devote like as much time as they devoted as a fan to hating on everything and they have to announce their departure like they're at a fucking airport oh yeah well <laughs> and it's exactly but it's like first of all i can't imagine going through life with that much anger and hate me neither and and it just it blows my mind that you could decide i don't want to be part of this anymore and then you just basically like dick around on the outskirts of it just like yelling at the people inside you know all day long like yeah, just <laughs> like just just makes their new hobby is now making everyone who actually still likes the thing feel like shit for liking the thing yeah like, i wish i had the free fucking time <laughs> i know right like but, good lord i got some work for them to do if okay. if they if they they're busy but anyway so you know you get that you get that crap and now i've really gone off on a tangent basically but you know um and it's just so hateful and just so like put yourself in somebody else's shoes for once in your selfish goddamn life 
just for one second before you pop off at the mouth and, and tell somebody they're being a baby or whatever. It's just, I just, it pisses me off. Anyway, that's probably part of the reason why I'm feeling very bitchy tonight. Same. <laughs> so here's, here's what gets me. And there's a lot of things that get me <laughs> about this. <laughs> the tone of it. I've not, I've not read waypoints, but I did read this, this section because you shared the screenshot with me, but the tone of that passage was less taking pot shots at the Outlander production team and more advocating for a culture shift. Yeah. Because how many times, how many shows under the guise of historical accuracy, which we have covered <laughs> ad nauseum, is bullshit. How many times have we seen this tired line where sexual violence is overly sexualized, is sensationalized, is not handled respectfully, all of this stuff for shock value or... For funsies, I don't know. To be edgy, I don't know. But what Sam's tone was, at least that was my understanding of it, his tone was challenging that as a mm -hmm. trope. Like, why are we using it as a storytelling device when we could do better? Yep. And that's important. He said basically the same things that we said, mm -hmm. like what you imagine you know, your imagination is so much worse. Why, why do you have to put it out there? Yeah, he said, he did. He said a lot of the same things we did, but he said it much more succinctly than we did. Cause oh, we yeah. employ, have, well, we get going, boy, we don't have an editor. He's, <laughs> he's well, and he's just a wonderful person. I mean, yes. we, I yes. talked on here about how he's such a people pleaser before and, you know, it comes through because even when he's, you know, making valid points about things that were done to him that were not right. Um, he's still so gracious and succinct and um, careful not to be accusatory or point fingers yeah. and or be sensational about it, you know? Yeah, he's he was just advocating for culture shift, which is very important. Like, a society that is permissive or sensationalize, sensationalizes sexual violence content in media like this, I'm not going to say it's direct, like it, that there's a causal relationship, but there is a correlation between that and a society that's permissive of actual perpetration of sexual violence against real people. Absolutely. And so what he did was take a really good step towards changing that. So that's one thing that gets me. The other thing that gets me is he did that, which is fucking brave. Mm -hmm. And then he got dragged for the last week. He's been dragged for the last week as we're recording this. It could continue with bullshit clickbait headlines thrown together by two bit muckraking journalists, quote unquote journalists who haven't read mm -hmm. the fucking book and no. assholes Don't, on Twitter. Probably never seen the show. Know yeah. nothing about it. They just heard this. They heard this thing, and so they're taking they're taking the discourse off of off of the tweeter. And we all know that yeah. the tweeter is where the. No, nah, I almost said a really bad word. The tweet, <laughs> even for me, the tweeter is where you don't go for non biased news or well thought out opinions. You're just not going to find it there. Yep. So how many men in Hollywood, show business in general, are seeing this and thinking, holy shit, if this is happening to Sam over this, what happened to me was way worse. I can mm -hmm. never tell a soul. I can never tell a soul because at least the pain I'm suffering in private is my own. Yeah. It's not public. That's what kills me. Yep. Is that it continues, that sort of backlash continues to perpetuate this, this world we're living in 
where male survivors aren't believed, aren't supported, are treated like shit. And we have seen it happen to other to other stars mm-hmm. who have actually experienced sexual violence through the course of their career. Terry Crews, Brendan Fraser tried to come forward and got shut down. And look how that turned out. Like, is this what we want to keep doing? And I think Hollywood is in such a, a weird position because not only do you have this like patriarchal, you know, still very much these structures in Hollywood that try to keep men being men for lack of a better way to mm. say it and you know try to silence like we we kind of like got them to stop trying to silence women but now they're still trying to silence men and then mm. men of course have their own hang-ups because of the patriarchy about coming forward with these things and stuff like that and then it's like not only that but then you've still got these old assholes hanging around like Bill Murray, you know, who was making headlines a couple weeks ago because so many women are coming out and telling him or telling like about their terrible experience working with him. You know, on one end of the spectrum, you've still got these these just like awful men that have been terrible to their co-stars men and women throughout their entire careers and they're still being put in movies and still making an ungodly amount of money to do it yeah and and so you've got that too working against this whole thing of you know men need to just shut up and take it right like how do you even start to reconcile those two things? It's just, and, and, you know, let me put on my feminist hat a little, but like when we say that the patriarchy harms men too, this is what we're talking about. This is exactly what it is. This is toxic. This is what toxic masculinity is. You know, I just hope that especially with, the rise of having intimacy coordinators on sets. I just hope that that continues to change the tenor and tone of the way people behave, not just while they're filming, but on sets in general, because I have to assume that when there is an intimacy coordinator on set, it's that sends a message about behavior off the screen as well as on the screen. I would hope so. Okay. That was a great tangent. I think I can segue us back to the episode. (laughs) I was thinking of that too. So you go ahead. (laughs) I think I can do it. So speaking of um, telling male survivors to move on, how about Claire? Who's so as I, yep, we did start having this conversation that they seem Jamie and Claire in this episode seem like they've gotten to a point where they're not angry at each other anymore over this whole, but what about Frank thing? Jamie's being very reasonable and he lays out this really excellent argument of you chose me lady. Mm -hmm. And Claire is like you said, very single-minded. What about, what about Frank? Can't you let it go? Blah, 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 blah. And Jamie says, no, I can't let it go. What Randall did to me was worse than death. I would rather him have killed me, but he didn't. And so we can't both walk this earth at the same time and me no peace. Like that's what he said is what he needs for his healing journey. Lady, just let him do it. Like if she hadn't stopped him, if he had just, I had this theory here, I have a theory. If she hadn't stopped him from actually going through with the duel the original one and just let him be smart about it let them like have a good safe place to be where the gendarme aren't gonna find them 
and then not fucking interrupted, right. he would have won. He probably would have won. Just because he's got so much rage. Yeah. Absolutely. And it still would have been fine. <laughs> but would he have stabbed Frank in the... Or not Frank! Oh my god! <laughs> would, this week's would he, non-canon ship of the week. <laughs> would he still have uh, stabbed uh, BJR in the penis? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, maybe... <laughs> <laughs> it is possible i just yeah it and- was such a random damn place to stab him though like i know <laughs> well i mean i mean no true? no not really <laughs> given the context given the you no know, that's fair you know what it's, it's a good good shot <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, and you know, you were talking, we were just talking about the, the, the graphic nature of some of this stuff and it's not this episode, but that, I mean, in this episode, we see Fergus in the brothel and clearly being caught by somebody who we know ends up being black Jack Randall. Um, and so we don't see, um, but we don't see the actual action. Um, but that's coming. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to have a lot to say about that. Oh week. boy. Me too. Um, but speaking of Fergus, before we get like, let's Fergus with the bandages or whatever he was playing with. Around it's his head. The best scene. I love he's it so much. So cute. <laughs> well, it's like he's he gets to be a kid, right? Like yeah. here's this kid. He's going up in a brothel. So it's you know, it's not like he's had any sort of real childhood experience and it it's the seventeen hundreds, so I mean that's pretty scarce still anyway. <laughs> that's um, saying something. You know. <laughs> and he um and then he comes and he's working for Jamie and he's like doing all this spy shit and stuff. And, you know, it's, it's just cute to get to see this little moment of him just being a kid, you know, and doing something that is so freaking universal, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> or like playing when Jamie with- asks, <laughs> playing with stuff <laughs> instead of paying attention. Yeah. Or when yeah. Jamie asks him if he's hungry, he says, always. Always. <laughs> he's so boy. adorable. He's just standing there like, and he's so proud of himself that he like took care of Claire. And like, he's just, I mean, he's just thriving. He is. Uh, you know, while, while everybody else is just kind of falling to pieces, <laughs> Fergus is living his best life. Show um, enough. Show enough. And Roman um, is just adorable. Oh my goodness oh gracious. He is so cute. He was. Well, I mean, he's still a good looking kid, but yeah. Right. But like he's yeah, no, he was adorable. He's no longer. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um and it it's like, you know, so kind of going back to our conversation about like, you know, this isn't very rewatchable and some of the stuff, like I don't know, like, there's a couple parts in this episode where I'm like, is this just included because Diana, like, researched something and then she couldn't wait to tell people? Because, like, first of all, like, Claire's concoction to make smallpox, right? Like, yeah, it's, it's like, this is so hyper specific. This seems, you know, unnecessary. Um, And it's, you know, like they test the bitter cascara or whatever that she uses. And it's like, I think you guys already know what that's like. So. (laughs) Yeah, no, she's just making Jamie violently ill for fun. (laughs) And then there's that conversation with Monsieur Ferre (laughs) where he's like, he's just like, talking to Claire and then all of a sudden he's like the creepy guy at the bar that like 
got really drunk and won't shut up and is like talking about like <laughs> holding beating hearts in his hand and shit. And you're like, whoa, bro, like <laughs> settle down there. And again, it was so specific and really just kind of like out of left field. Cause like, I, I get like the kind of the point was that he was trying to like send Claire a warning to send to master Raymond. But like at the same time, I'm like, <laughs> we didn't need all of that information. Was, like look up TMI in the dictionary and it's his fucking face like that was just <laughs> imagine just being on a date with this guy and, and he won't like, stop talking about oh, work so what do you do for a living <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's like, have you ever held a beating heart in your hand <laughs> why Good lord that's when you just like excuse me i need to go powder my nose and you don't come back <laughs> But, like, you just know that for some reason, Diana looked that up and then just, like, just couldn't resist adding it. <laughs> like, I just... It's okay for things to learn things and just It can know just them. be for you. It can just be for you. Or, like... Put it on a blog post like a normal person. Like, just put it on Tumblr. That yes. kind of shit Tumblr would eat up. Oh, my gosh. And, like, you know, I understand the need to, like, look up what foods are in a 18th century pantry. But For we fuck's don't need, sake. We don't need to know. <laughs> we don't need the grocery list. Like, we don't. Okay, but the... I do have to say, though, the grocery list in bees was cute because um, the way she was, like, talking to Jamie, like, no, not those ones, the other ones, because that's kind of universal shit, mar married shit. But generally speaking, no, we don't need it. <laughs> I need someone with all of the books on Kindle to do a search. And you can start with, like, like book four and go forward when they're when they're in America. But I just need someone to look up the phrase wizened apple and tell me how many time it, times it appears. Singular or plural. I, I will try to get that done this week. I just need to know. <laughs> because I feel like it's really fucking a lot. <laughs> oh, God. When, they, when she describes like how they make the blood sausage or the blood pudding or whatever the hell they call it i'm like i don't need to know this lady i could have died and never known this and been totally happy with my life <laughs> and i like to look up weird shit okay so it's saying a lot <laughs> <laughs> i mean me too uh again tumblr tumblr would eat it up god there's another part so Jamie, I feel like, is trying to be, like, really reasonable about shit in this episode. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> nobody's listening to him. Because yeah, as he's I, trying. <laughs> because as I listened to him talk to the Compt after the they had the fake robbery set up and stuff, like, the Compt was 100% right. Like, his gut was spot on <laughs> that it was <laughs> set up. But also, Jamie made some really compelling, reasonable arguments <laughs> that, like, should have convinced the comp that he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm thinking maybe, like, when Myrta punched him in the face, that transferred the brain cell. There you go. There you go. That's what we'll go. It just takes a little, a little additional head trauma. And I'm kind of, like, skipping around because our outline is just whatever right now it, yeah it's fine <laughs> so we've got claire she looks very pregnant right she looks like pretty close to ready to pop mm -hmm. um but jamie is just feeling the baby kick for the first time 
And then he like asks if they're going to hurt the baby by having sex. And I'm like, you've been having sex this whole time. Now you're, why are you just now worried about if you're like, that doesn't make any sense, James. Um, You called him James. (laughs) (laughs) Mark me. (laughs) Mark me. This makes no sense, James. Um... (laughs) It's just not occurring occurring to him. (laughs) And then she's at the hospital and she's not doing well. Mother Hildegard makes her lay down and spend the night. And she's like, oh, it's common to bleed a little at this stage. Oh, she said leak. She didn't say bleed because no, it's not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She said it's common to leak a little. And I'm like. The F is going on here. She's got blood streaked down her freaking legs. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. that's not normal. That's not normal. But at the same time, there is nothing they can do for her. No. So, like, the best thing that Mother Hildegard could do in that situation was have her rest and try to keep her calm. But, like, she shouldn't have even let her go home the next day. I mean. Oh, probably not. I was just like, are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> I'm just like, I feel like we're underreacting a little here, people. Um, <laughs> I get it, though. No, I get it. But then I'm also like, at what stage are we at? Because I can't tell. Yeah. And I mean, I know the big, the big thing is that the issue, part of the issue is that the pregnancy and the date of conception are all screwy in yeah. the show compared to the book because she had to have gotten pregnant back at Lallybrock. And I'm trying to like do the mental math of how long it has been since they had sex at Lallybrock. And it feels like a fucking eternity. I, <laughs> Probably does declare <laughs> <don't>... <laughs> too at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just like, how pregnant is she? And like, it just, it just makes me laugh because Outlander just, especially in the show, because they change things around, they're just like, pay no attention to the timeline. <laughs> but it's a time travel show. What's, it's what kind is of time? important. But what is time, Beth? What is, what is a line? And how... <sighs> Like, no. What is what is time? Time doesn't matter. It just hurts. I really should have had alcohol today. <laughs> I had half a thought. What's that? I forgot it. Okay. <laughs> it's gone. It'll come back or it won't. I, I was thinking, though, that that breakfast spread looked pretty good. You know, that, that's just, like, laid out for them every day. That's a lot of food, though. I know. What are they doing with it? Well, it's pretty wasteful, right? And, of course, <laughs> poor Claire, you know, tries to make a a point to uh, her aristocratic friends about the poor in Paris. And <laughs> their solution Ugh. is to freaking... <laughs> She's like... Move we- them. <laughs> remove them from the streets and make them stay in a different part of Paris so they don't have to look at them. And that, kids, is how the French Revolution happened. <laughs> <laughs> so that tea party or whatever the hell it was with Louise and her friends is, I realize that's the reason that I don't really like Louise. That's why I remembered that's why I remembered her unfavorably. Yeah, is because of that scene. It was just so. Oh, the hen cackling! I couldn't. It was. It was like really kind of in your like, in your face though, right? Like, yeah. Um, and I get that like the French aristocracy really was pretty horrible, um, but it was kind of like a little heavy handed. Um. It was. It was not subtle. They phoned it in. <laughs> they really phoned it in. <laughs> they were just like, like they could not have reacted worse. <laughs> like, oh God. Um. Yeah. So then I got. Oh, 
did you have another another th- something to say? Just as um <laughs> as negative as I've been for this entire episode, the last five minutes of this episode are the most interesting, but also pretty freaking infuriating. Like they did a good. I have to give them definite props for how they dealt with the tension of Claire coming home and finding that Jamie has gone to duel. Like they did a good job with the pacing on that. And we finally got a carriage chase. (laughs) It was disastrous. Just in the (laughs) time. It was absolutely horrible. But as usual, um sam hewan's facial acting at the end as like the sound is cutting out because Ugh. claire is fainting that it just damn break damn. my heart so i know good. Ugh. break my heart yeah i mean and and you just know that disaster's coming and mm-hmm. no you're right that that last sequence is chef's kiss and it's um, very good and blackjack though like is i'm gonna say some nice shit about him and then i'm gonna go back to saying mean shit about claire (laughs) blackjack is just like his posture through the duel is um cocky and entertaining like it's kind of it's kind of fun to watch honestly i would like to see them have a nice fair fight it is a good, it is a very good fight scene. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it, but it's, you know, the cocky and sort of let me entertain you attitude of Jack Randall just in contrasted with Jamie's just absolute rage mm-hmm. just shows you how evil Jack Randall is because this is all a joke to him. Oh yeah, absolutely. He doesn't give a shit. Jamie is just someone he has played with and in, mm-hmm. and in his mind won. Right. Um, and he, it, this is like amusing to him and what he's just done to Fergus and he is just, he doesn't give a shit. He is so depraved that this is all just a a joke to him. Yeah. Um, And Sam and Sam and Tobias have very good chemistry in this scene. I think it's a different, it's a different kind of chemistry than what you might typically think of. Cause you, you know, you typically think of like, um, the actors playing the love interest kind of thing, but they they do good fight scenes together. Yeah, it's good to see them on equal footing. Yeah, yeah, and it and it shows. Now, Randall put up a really good fight, right? He did. Like he, but you could see him also visibly tiring faster. Mm-hmm than Jamie and it was a very subtle way of showing that when all other things are equal Jamie is the better man yep yep I like that part about um which I don't think anyone would argue with that but I, I I think it's a cool way to to show it right that like all of Randall's power an ability to control Jamie, manipulate Jamie, hurt Jamie, all of that was derived from his position of power because now they're in Paris and, and, and actually technically Jamie's on better footing than he is. And he, you know, you ain't so special Jack Randall. Right. <laughs> and it just, it's kind of like, Oh, He's just a mediocre man. He was just, you know. (laughs) He's just, he's just just a person. He's just a human. It's kind of a shitty human, but he's a human. And so now Jamie has, if nothing else, he has 
he can be secure in the knowledge that right now Randall is only alive because of a choice Jamie made. Mm -hmm. And when you think about things like what we talked about with Hollywood and the patriarchy, Mm -hmm. you can see how the patriarchy holds up and empowers mediocre or even terrible human being men (laughs) and gives them power that they don't deserve. And that goes into patriarchy and then all the power structures of the British empire. And, you know, then we could just, our heads could explode, but it's, (laughs) it's really, (laughs) um, but it's really interesting. Ooh, speaking of the British empire, brief break from this conversation. I'm so excited because Prince Harry's book is coming out in January. And that you, title though, if you think I'm not going to devour that shit with my entire being, you do not know me. <laughs> we will have I two am- whole episodes devoted <laughs> to Prince Harry's. Book. I immediately pre-ordered that shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> That title, uh, that title is intense. I can't wait. Oh, I can't wait. Because, you know, if if you've watched any of the interviews or like if you watched the Oprah interview a couple years ago and, and all of that, like he's not afraid to pull punches. And, oh, <laughs> I mm-hmm. can't wait. Yeah. Tear them all down, Harry. Take them all down. <laughs> Gonna be good. Yes. Anyway, I digress. I digress. How long do you think um, he's been sitting on that book, though? Because, like, I think, I think they announced that he was going to write it like about a year ago or so. Okay. So, but I mean, but I'm sure it's been brewing, you know, for a while. And, but if you think about it, like it's going to come out like basically around the three year anniversary of them announcing that they were going to be stepping down as working royals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, so that's three years, but I think, I think, you know, just from what I've read and my observations and stuff like that, you know, they've really been on a journey with this um as a family you know harry and megan um because i think them stepping down was like because they'd reached a crisis point and they just had to get get out of that whole mess and then ever since then they've been processing and healing and coming to terms with everything so it's going to be good. Going to be good. Mm-hmm. I think we covered most of your points on here about things that make no sense about this episode. Yeah. The only other one that I added was that to just to really beat the stead horse, like it doesn't even make sense that Jamie would want Claire to go back with Frank when his family is right there. Yeah. Like yeah, it doesn't make a lick of sense. Like, first of all, they don't know, they don't understand how the time travel works because Claire, she just, she's only done it once. She has no idea if she can do it again, nor does she know if the baby can do it. Yeah. (laughs) He doesn't, you know, he doesn't really know Frank and he's like, well, I want you to go back to a man who loves you. Like, as if she wouldn't be able to find, well, maybe she wouldn't be able to find a man who loved her in the 18th century. I don't know. (laughs) But I'm just like, I just, I just, ever since we got into that conversation, like last week or the week before about constructing these weird convoluted plot things, I just, now I'm seeing it everywhere. And I'm just like, that doesn't even make sense that that would be his first instinct is to, to send her back. It really doesn't. (laughs) Oh my God. Anyway. So that's all I had to say about that. I had, I didn't write this down. It just kind of occurred to me. 
that the scheme that Claire and Jamie come up with to fake smallpox on the clump ship to have the wine destroyed is um why did they think that would work <laughs> just asking for a friend why did they think that would work when they knew in the, was it the first episode the first yeah. fucking episode they know that the comp does not give two shits and they know that the harbor master can be bought off why did they think that would work well it Exactly, because she, I mean, I think it's her cockiness that yeah. she, that it did work in that first episode. But what she, what, the, what they did not consider is that the only reason that worked was because it was very public. It was public and she was there talking about it out loud in front of people. Right, exactly. <laughs> so I, I don't understand. So it was like, if you just want to mildly poison your spouse and like torture them with if that's the way you want your bdsm to go fine like you don't have to make up you don't have to come up with these weird convoluted schemes you can just do the kinky shit it's fine i promise she's trying to <laughs> she's trying to make him pay for for the whole argument about jack randall killing what? jack randall <laughs> Also not her call, so that I don't God bless. Um but again, it's like Diana was like, Oh, it would be some really cool shit if you could fake smallpox. Sure <laughs> so would. There you have it. Maybe you should not have established that the person you're trying to screw over with the fake smallpox doesn't give a damn about real smallpox. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it might work on someone with morals. <laughs> oh, God. The Paris episodes where nothing makes any sense. Nothing at all. The whole plot. <laughs> you know, when. <laughs> you know, in the first season, when Ned's like, we are about to build a, a boat completely made of paper or something like that. Oh, it got soggy. Yeah, it got it's soggy. Happening right now, and it's not pretty. I miss Ned. Bring him back. Bring back Ned. Bring back Dougal. <laughs> oh, don't worry. We're gonna get to see that messy bitch soon. <laughs> He's such a much messy bitch. Careful yep. what you wish for. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh God. He does have some of the best one-liners later in the season, but I will save it. Speaking of messy bitches, what have you come up with to uh, what used to be our non-canon ship of the week and is now just the segment where you say something that appalls me? <laughs> so just so that our listeners are aware, when I pulled up this, I pulled up the prep document this morning to see like if Beth, has Beth made some notes because you watched before I did. And she literally changed the title of the segment to Pan Horrifies Beth. <laughs> I'm still traumatized from last week, by the way. That was last week. Oh, yeah. King and Blackjack. Yeah. You know what, though? <laughs> it could work. Oh. So I know that... There was like this whole I don't trust you thing with the Comte Saint-Germain about going to Le Havre with Jamie. Yeah. But I feel like that's not all. And I also feel like something had to happen along the way on the road for it to not freak him out when Jamie just grabbed him from behind. Remember in the Scottish prisoner, the frogs and the slime wrap <laughs> Congress? How could I ever forget? <laughs> now apply it to this. Oh, God. Sweaty slime wraps. You're welcome. I hate it so much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need, I need something. <laughs> 
an emotional support beverage. <laughs> oh, <God>. Pepto. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm just gonna take take it all. Just, just, just. I'm just gonna go in the medicine cabinet and just do a little sampling. <laughs> Party mix, uppers, downers, and candy corn. Little, little something to get the taste of the vomit out of your mouth. Dayquil <laughs> and Nyquil, sure. Kids, do not try this at home. Don't, we don't do drugs. Oh my. Well, oh maybe not at that. <laughs> uh, so we didn't really have much to talk about for John. Usually, even though we don't have anything on the document, something comes up during the, we're in a weird time. Yeah, today was a weird day. Um, <laughs> my DOA, not, yeah, my DOA fic and my fic rack have to do with John. So I can, okay. I can be a little um, rambly about those. <laughs> but you wrote down something for, for the, the fic that you added to your dead on arrival list. I did. And, and I really, it's not really a fleshed out idea, but I just had a, I did have like a little bit of an urge to write like a Halloween AU. Mm -hmm. But the only reason was because <laughs> there was somebody, somebody posted something on Twitter about, um, about Jamie and Claire with Halloween. And they were like, Oh, they would never dress up. Like Jamie would see it as just unnecessary nonsense. And Claire would just be like too busy for that, you know, because she's a doctor and stuff. And I was like, wow, you must be really fun at parties. And then I just, <laughs> and then I just kind of wanted to write a spite fic just to just, just, you know because but then i i ended up i'm a terrible outlander fan and i just ended up writing um a halloween fic for in the, my, the other fandom i'm in so sorry you guys <laughs> <laughs> jamie would so dress up like as soon as oh you my could, god as soon as you got as soon as you convinced him that it wasn't like devil worship he would absolutely have fun and like i just kind of want to see him high on snickers well <laughs> And that's the whole thing is that like you can't when when you're writing like modern AU, you can't put like 18th century ideals and stuff on the characters like, you know, Jamie in the 18th century might think it's kind of nonsense. But like, if he were a 21st century man, like there'd be no reason for him to think that way. Right. He's like, he'd, he'd be very different. Anything for fun. Yeah. Claire would totally dress up. It might take a little liquid courage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could see her being the person that wears to like to work, wears a shirt that says like, this is my costume, but like, <laughs> <laughs> but I bet you JV would get her get her to dress up to anyway. drag her to a costume party because daria is there yeah we haven't talked about daria in ages either i know i miss daria uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to come up with something bullshit as always yes and what was your stuff here so this is actually i didn't have any new ideas i've actually popped this out of my idea folder um, because I, it, it's probably not going to actually happen and maybe it'll be included in something as an element, but not, um, not its own thing. Um, but this would be like a canon divergent kind of thing. Um, I thought it would be interesting. I've not really seen it done in detail where Jamie and John have to navigate their trauma through a sexual mm -hmm. encounter with each other. I thought it would be an interesting way to like really explore how they work around it using 18th century appropriate language for 21st century modern audience when they're both triggered by the same thing. Mm. So really, really just depressing 
of an idea, but one of those, could I make it work kind of things, which is probably why it's not going to happen because, you know, it's an element. It's not really a fic on its, on its own, you know? So, um, in, uh, wrote Jen's fic. So that's JRC 10 on, um, AO3 and I think she's Rosie Claire 10 on Twitter. Um, she wrote, so she wrote two, um, JJC, uh, fix in the same, like one was like one and then a sequel. Mm -hmm. And in the second one, fire closest kept, she majorly addresses Jamie's trauma. Um, she's never read the Lord John books. So Mm -hmm. I, she she wouldn't have even known that John had trauma to, to heal, but, um, she she does it so well. Um, and with such, it's just so well thought out, like how she shows Jamie working through his trauma through his relationship with Claire and John um, as they're like kind of growing as a thruple. Um, and it's, that's really good. So I, Ooh. I guess I just threw in a bonus fic bonus rec, rec. Um, because you've got <laughs> one too. So, but that, that she does an excellent job and Claire plays a big part in it too. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah so that's a good one to Ooh. to read up on too good rec thank you yeah and what's your rec my fig rec this week is a short one shot called come back to me by holly mack this one i picked this one because it has to do with a duel so this is actually the scottish prisoner because i'm you know me obsessed <laughs> At the end, <laughs> this is a different take on the aftermath of John's duel with 12 trees at the end of The Scottish Prisoner and how a, another way that Jamie might have handled it. Hmm. It's very good, very sweet. John gets a lot of love. Love it. Nice. Love it when John gets love. Yeah. Come back to me by Holly Mack. We will link that in the post. Nice. Uh, I didn't see any mail. Did you see any mail? No mail. No mail this time. Well, we want to hear from you. So please reach out to us, whether it's on social media at Lord John Lander on Tumblr or Twitter, um, or also on what's where the hell's our website? WordPress. WordPress. (laughs) (laughs) Find us there. Send us a note if you want to be kept anonymous. We don't have anonymous capabilities on anything. Um, but if you want to be kept anonymous, let us know. And we will not share your name. Um, unless you're an asshole, in which case we're going to put you on blast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Well, we've, uh, I believe, come to the end of the road on this one. <laughs> I think we have. I'm going to so, go make some tea. <laughs> and then you you go make some tea and then work your magic so that to to make me not sound like an idiot throughout this this episode. <laughs> We're idiots together. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we will talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you're listening to this, it means you survived another episode of Lord John Lander. We'd love to hear from you on Twitter or Tumblr at Lord John Lander or on our website at lordjohnlander.wordpress.com slash contact us. All opinions expressed on the Lord John Lander podcast belong to us and are not affiliated with Outlander, Sony, Stars, and definitely 100% not with Diana Gabaldon. This podcast is not suitable for children, immature adults, homophobes, anyone who takes fandom seriously, people who don't understand that the characters aren't real, people with sticks up their ass, people who hate fun, and people with no sense of humor. Do not try any of these hot takes at home. We are professionals. And if you know us in real life, no you don't.